Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Okay. The second year, yes. Okay. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Gyana Anjana Salakhaya Chakshurun Militam Gyana Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Katha Mahyam Dadati Svapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yutapada Kamalan Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadhvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishaka Anvitamscha Namom Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swaminitinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Sunyavadi Pashyatya Di Satarine Vancha Kalpadra Bhishakrapa Sindhu Bheva Chapatitanam Pavane Pyo Vaishnavi Pyo Namo Namaha Yes, Sri Krishna Chetanya Prabhunityan and the Sri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sadikora Bhakta Brinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Reading from Srila Prabhupada Lilamrat, Volume 1, Chapter 8. 18, sorry. Breaking ground. Swami Bhaktivedanta came to USA and went swiftly to the archetype spiritual neighborhood, the New York Lower East Side, and installed intact an ancient, perfectly preserved piece of street India. He adorned a storefront as his ashram and adored, adored Krishna therein, and by patience and good humor singing, uh, chanting and expounding Sanskrit terminology day by day established Krishna consciousness in the uh, psychedelic mind manifesting center of America East to choose to attend to the lower east side what kindness and humility and intelligence Allen Ginsberg from his introduction to the Macmillan Bhagavad Gita as it is Prabhupada's new neighborhood was not as run down as the nearby Bavari, though it certainly was less than quaint. Right across from his storefront, a row of tombstones looked out from the somber, dimly lit display windows of Weitzner Brothers and Paper Memorials. North of Weitzner Brothers was Sam's Luncheonetta. Next to Sam stood an ancient four-story building marked AIR, then Ben J. Horowitz monuments, more gravestones, and finally Schwartz Funeral Home. On the next block at number 43, a worn canvas awning jutted out onto the sidewalk. Provenzano Lanza funeral home. Then there was Cosmos parcels, Im importers, and a few blocks further uptown the prominent black and white signboard of the Village East Theatre. Up a block, uh, but on the same side of the avenue as the storefront was the Church of uh, Nativity and uh, sorry, an old three-story building with new blue paint and a gold-colored cross on top. The six-story 26-second avenue, its face covered by a greenish fire escape, crouched against the massive nine-story uh, Knickerbocker fireproof warehouse. Second avenue was a main traffic uh, artery, of, uh, artery for East Manhattan and the spotlight at the intersection of Houston and Second pumped a stream of delivery trucks, taxis, and private autos past Prabhupada's door. From early morning until night, there would be cars zooming by 
followed by the sound of brakes and uh, the competitive tension of waiting bumper to bumper, the impetus honking, then gears grinding, engines rumbling and revving and again the zooming by. The traffic was distractingly heavy. At 26 Second Avenue, there were actually two story fronts, two store fronts. The one to the north was a coin laundry and the one to the south had been a gift shop but was now vacant. Both had narrow entrances, large display windows and dull paint. Beneath the matchless gifts sign was a window, six feet square, that a few weeks before had displayed match boxes decorated with photos of movie stars of the 30s and 40s. The sign matchless gifts was the only remaining memento of the nostalgic gift shop that had recently moved out. Below the shop's window, a pair of iron doors in the sidewalk hid stone steps to the cellar and boiler room. The wide sidewalk had been laid down in sections of various shapes and sizes at different times years past. Certain sections had cracked or caved in and in a and a few and a fine dust with tiny sparkling shards of glass had collected in the cracks and depressions. A dull black fire hydrant stood on the curb. Midway between the entrances to the two store fronts was the main entrance to the number 26. This door opened into a foyer uh, lined with mailboxes and intercoms and then a locked inner door opened into a hallway leading to the sta stairs or back to the courtyard. To the left of the gift shop's window was its front door, a dark wooden frame holding a full length pane of glass. The door opened into the long, narrow storefront, which was now completely bare. Just inside, to the right of the door, a platform extending beneath the display window was just the proper height for a seat. At the far end of the bare, dingy room, two grimy paned windows covered with bars opened into the courtyard. To the left of the left-hand window was a small sink fixed to the outside of, of a very small toilet closet whose door faced the front of the store. A door on the store's left wall connected to a hallway that led into the courtyard. The courtyard was paved with concrete geometric sec sec sections and uh, encircled with shrub gardens and tall trees. There was a picnic table a cement bird bath and a bird house on a pool on a pole and near the center of the courtyard were two shrub gardens the country yard so the courtyard so the, the courtyard was bordered north and south by high walls and front and back by two tenements the patch of sky above gave relief Overlooking the courtyard from the rear building of 26 Second Avenue was Prabhupada's second floor apartment where he would now live, work and worship. With help from his Bavari friends, he had cleaned and settled into his new home. In the back room, his office, he had placed against one wall a thin cushion with an elephant print cover and in front of the cushion his unpainted metal suitcase which served as a desk. He had set his typewriter on the desk and his papers uh, and books on either side. This became his work area. His manuscripts bundled in saffron color, uh, cloth, his talk of Srimad Bhagavatams and his few personal effects he kept in the closet opposite his desk. On the wall above his sitting place, he hung an Indian calendar print of Lord Krishna. Krishna, as a youth, was playing on his flute with a cow close behind him. Lord Krishna was standing on the planet which covered uh, which fire escape <coughs> fell across the floor. 
The next room was bare except for a fancy coffee table which became Prabhupada's altar. Here he placed a framed picture of Lord Chaitanya and his associates. On the wall he hung an Indian calendar print of four armed Lord Vishnu and Anantasesha, the celestial snake. And as in the Bavari loft, he put up a cloth line. Both rooms were freshly painted and the floors were clean, hardwood, parquet. The bathroom was clean and serviceable, as was the narrow, furnished kitchen. Prabhupada would sometimes stand by the kitchen window, gazing beyond the courtyard wall. He had moved here without any prospects of paying the next month's rent. Although Carl, Mike, Carol, James, Bill, and others had encouraged him to move here, some of them now found it a little inconvenient to visit him regularly, but they all wished him well and hoped new people would come here to help him. They felt that this location was the best yet, and he seemed more comfortable here. At the paradox, Bill would spread the word of Swamiji's new address. The Lower East Side has a history of change and human suffering as old as New York. 300 years before Prabhupada arrived, Prabhupada's arrival, it had been part of Peter uh, Stuyvesant's estate. Today's landmark of Tom Skins Square Park had then been a salt marsh known as uh, Stuyvesant's Swamp. The Lower East Side first became a slum in 1840s when thousands of Irish immigrants driven by Irish potato famine came and settled. Two decades later, the Irish became the image of American to the next immigrants, the Germans who gradually grew in numbers to become the largest immigrant group in New York City. Next came East European Jews, Poles and Ukrainians, and by 1900, the Lower East Side had become the most densely populated Jewish ghetto in the world. But in the next generation, the ghetto began to break up as Jews moved to suburbs and economic advancement. Next, the Puerto Ricans thronged in. Hundreds of thousands in the 1950s immigrating from their island poverty or moving in from East Harlem. Then they and the Negroes from Harlem and Bedford, uh, Stuyvesant, who arrived next, were the new groups who, along with Poles and uh, uh, Ukrainians, populated the two square miles of tenements and crowded streets that formed the Lower East Side slums in the 1960s. Then. Only a few years before Prabhupada's arrival, a different kind of slum dweller had appeared on the east and the lower east side. Although there have been many sociological and cultural analysis of this phenomenon, it remains ultimately inexplicable why they suddenly came, like a vast flock of birds swooping down or like animals in a great instinctual migration and why after a few years they vanished. At first, the newcomers were mostly young artists, musicians, and intellectuals, similar to the hip crowd of Prabhupada's Babari days. Then came the young middle class dropouts. Because living space was more available and rents were lower than in nearby Greenwich Village, they concentrated here on the Lower East Side, which in the parlance of the renting agents became known as the East Village. Many even came without finding a place to live and camped in the hallways of tenements. Drawn by cheap rent and the promise of bohemian freedom, these young middle-class dropouts, the <clears throat> <clears throat> avant-garde of a nationwide youth movement, soon to be known in the media as hippies, wandered to the lower east side slums in living pro test against America's good life of materialism. As if responding to an instinctual call, younger teenage runaways joined the older hippies and following the runaways came the police, consular, social and welfare workers, youth hostels and drug counseling centers. 
on saint mark's place a new hip commercialized commercialism sprang up with head shops poster shops record shops art galleries and bookstores that carried everything from cigarette papers to hip clothes and uh, psychedelic uh, psychedelic um, lighting the hippies journey to the lower east side in full conviction that this was the place to be just as their immigration predecessors had done for the european immigrants of another age new york harbor had been the getaway to a land of riches and opportunities as they long last uh, set their eyes on manhattan's skyline and the statue of liberty now in 1966 american youth thronged on to new york city with hopes of their own and feasted on the vision of their new found mystical land the lower east side slums it was an uneasy coexistence with hippies on one side and uh, puerto ricans poles and ukrainians on the other side on the other the established ethnic groups resented the newcomers who didn't really have to live in the slums whereas they themselves did in fact many of the new uh, many of the young newcomers were from immigrant families that had struggled for generations to establish themselves as middle class americans nevertheless the youth migration to the lower east side was just as real as the immigration of puerto ricans or poles or ukrainians had been although the motives of course were quite different the hippies had turned from the suburb materialism of their parents uh, the inane happiness of tv and advertisement uh, advertising the ephemeral goals of middle class america they were disillusioned by parents teachers clergy public leaders and the media dissatisfied with american policy in vietnam and allured by the radical political ideologies that exposed america as a cruel selfish exploitative giant who must now reform or die and they were searching for a real love real peace real existence and real spiritual consciousness by the summer of shrila prabhupada's arrival at 26 second avenue the first front in the in the great youth rebellions of 60s had already entered the lower east side here they were free free to live in simple poverty and express themselves through art music drugs and sex the talk was of spiritual searching lsd and marijuana were the keys opening new realms of awareness notions about eastern culture and eastern religi- religions were in vogue through drugs yoga brotherhood or just by being free somehow they would attain enlightenment everyone was supposed to keep an open mind and develop his own cosmic philosophy by de- direct experience and drug expanded consciousness blended with his own ele- ec- eclectic readings and if their life appeared aimless at least they had dropped out of a pointless game where the player sells his soul off for material goods and in this way support a system that is already rotten so it was that in 1966 thousands of young people were walking the streets of the lower east side not simply intoxicated or crazy though they often were but in search of life's ultimate answers in complete disregard of the establishment and the day to day life pursued by millions of straight americans that the prosperous land of america could breed so many discontented youth surprise prabhupad of course it also further proved that material well being the hallmark of american life couldn't make people happy proper did not see the unhappiness around him in terms of the immediate social political economic and cultural causes neither slum conditions nor youth rebellions were all important realities these were mere symptoms of a universal unhappiness to which the only cure was krishna consciousness he sympathized with uh, the miseries of everyone but he saw the universal solution propad had not made a study of the youth movement in america before moving to the lower east side 
he had never ever he had never even made specific plans to come here amid so many young people but in the 10 months since calcutta he had been moved by force of circumstances or he understood it by krishna's will from one place to another on the order of his spiritual master he had come to america and by krishna's will he he had come to lower east side his mission here was the same as it had been on the bavari or um, uptown or even in india he was fixed in the order of his spiritual master and the vedic view a view that wasn't going to be influenced by radical changes of 1960s now if it so happened that these young people because of some change in american cultural climate were to prove more receptive to him then that would be welcome and that would also be by krishna's will actually because of the ominous influence of kali millennium this was historically the worst time of, worst of times for spiritual cultivation hippie revolution or not and shila prabhu Prabhupada was trying to transplant Vedic culture into a more alien ground than had any previous spiritual master. Than had any previous spiritual master. So he expected to find his work extremely difficult. Yet in this generally bad age, just prior to Prabhupada's arrival on the east, lower east side, tremors of dissatisfaction and revolt against the Kali Yuga culture itself began vibrating through American society. sending waves of young people to wander the streets of new york's lower east side in search of something beyond the ordinary life looking for alternatives seeking spiritual fulfillment these young people broke from their uh, stereotyped materialistic backgrounds and drawn together now on new york's lower east side where the one uh, where the ones sorry were the ones who were by chance or choice or destiny to become the congregation for the swami's storefront offering of kirtan and spiritual guidance the swami's arrival went unnoticed the neighbors said someone new had taken the gift shop next to the laundry there was a strange picture in the window now but no one knew what to make of it some passer by noticed a piece of paper announcing classes in bhagavad gita taped to the window a few stopped to read it but no one knew what to make of it they didn't know what bhagavad gita was and the few were didn't few who did thought maybe a yoga bookstore or something the, the puerto uh, ricans in the neighborhood would look in the window at have cohen's painting and then blankly walk away the manager of mobile gas station next door couldn't care less who had moved in it just didn't make any difference the tombstone sellers and undertakers across the street didn't care and for the drivers of the countless cars and trucks that passed by swami's place didn't even exist but there were young people around who had been intrigued with the painting who went up to the window to read the little piece of paper some of them even knew about the bhagavad gita although the painting of lord chaitanya and the dancers didn't seem to fit a few thought maybe they would attend swami bhaktivedanta's class classes and check out the scene july 1966 howard wheeler was hurrying from his apartment on mott street to a friend's apartment on 5th street a quiet place where he hoped to find some peace he walked up mott street to hoston turned right and began to walk east across bowery past the rushing traffic and stumbling derelicts toward second avenue howard after crossing bowery just before second avenue i saw swami ji john pili strolling down the sidewalk his head held high in the air his hand in the ba- in the bead bag he struck me like a famous actor in a very fam- familiar movie he seemed ageless he was wearing the traditional saffron colored robes of a sanyasi and quaint wild shoes with points coming down houston he looked like the jenny that popped out of aladdin's lamp howard aged 26 was a tall 
large bodied man with long dark hair a profuse beard and black framed eye glasses he was an instructor in english at ohio state university and was fresh from a trip to india where he had been looking for a true guru prabhupad noticed howard and they both stopped simultaneously howard asked the first question that popped into his mind are you from india prabhupad smiled oh yes and you howard i told him no but that i had just returned from india and was very interested in his country and the hindu philosophy he told me he had come from calcutta and had been in new york almost 10 months his eyes were as fresh and cordial as a child's and even standing before the trucks that roared and rumbled their way down houston street he emanated a cool tranquility that was unshakably established in something far beyond the great metropolis that roared around around us howard never made it to his friend's place that day he went back to his own apartment on mott street to kaith and valley uh, his roommates to tell them and everyone he knew about the guru who had inexplicably appeared within their midst kaith keith keith and howard had been to india now they were involved in various spiritual philosophies and their friends used to come over and talk about enlightenment 18 year old chuck barnett was a regular visitor chuck um, you would open the door of the apartment and thousands of cockroaches would disappear into the woodwork and the smell was enough to knock you over so keith was trying to clean the place up and kick some people out they were sharing the rent valley keith howard and several others due to a lack of any other process they were using lsd to try and increase their spiritual life actually we were all trying to use drugs to help in meditation anyway valley howard and keith were trying to find the perfect spiritual master as we all were howard remembers his own spiritual seeking as reading books on eastern philosophy and religion burning lots of candles and incense and taking ganja and peyote and lsd as aids to meditation actually it was more intoxication than meditation meditation was a formism that somehow connected our highs with our readings keith 29 the son of southern baptist minister was a phd candidate in history at columbus columbia university he was preparing his thesis on the rise of revivalism in the southern united states dressed in the old denim cutoffs sandals and t-shirts t-shirt he was something of a guru among the mott street coterie valley was his uh, was in his 30s shabbily dressed bearded intellectual and well read in buddhist literature he had been a radio engineer in the army and like his roommates was unemployed he was reading alan watts hamon hesse and others talking about spiritual enlightenment and taking lsd in india howard and keith had visited hardwar rishikesh benares and other holy cities experiencing indian temples hashish and dysentery one evening in calcutta they had come upon a group of sadhus chanting the hare krishna mantra and playing hand cymbals uh, for howard and keith as for many westerners the essence of indian philosophy was sankara's doctrine of impersonalism oneness everything is fa- false except the one impersonal spirit they had bought the books that told them whatever way you express your faith that way is a valid spiritual path now the three roommates howard keith and valley began to mix various philosophies into a hotspot of their own howard would mix in a little whiteman uh, em- emerson thoreau and blake keith would cite bi- biblical uh, biblical references and valley would add a bit of buddhist wisdom and they all kept up on timothy leary thomas a kempis and many others 
the whole mixture being subject to a total re-evaluation where whenever one of the group experienced a new cosmic insight through LSD. This was the group that Howard returned to that day in July. Excited, he told them about the Swami, how he looked and what he had said. Howard told how after they had stood and talked together, the Swami had mentioned his place nearby on 2nd Avenue where he was planning to hold some classes. Howard, I walked around the corner with him. He pointed out a small storefront building between 1st and 2nd streets uh, next door to a mobile filling station. It had been a curiosity shop and someone had painted the words matchless gifts over the window at that time. I didn't realize how prophetic these those words were. This is a good area. Uh, he asked me, this is a good area, he asked me. I told him that I thought it was. I had no idea what he was going to offer at his classes, but I knew that all my friends would be glad that an Indian Swami was moving into, neighbor, into the neighborhood. The word spread. Although it wasn't so easy now for Karl Yeager, Yergens and certain others to come up from Bavari and Chinatown, they had other things to do. Roy Dubois, a 25-year-old writer for comic books, had visited Prabhupada on Bavari, and when he heard about the Swami's new place, he wanted to drop by. James Greeny and Bill Epstein had not forgotten the Swami, and they wanted to come. The Paradox Restaurant was still a live con connection and brought new interested people, and others like Stephen uh, Gori no saw the Swami's sign in the window. Steve, age 26, was a caseworker for the city's welfare department and one day on his lunch break, as he was walking home, as he was walking home from the welfare office at 5th Street and 2nd Avenue, he saw the Swami's sign taped to the window. He had been reading a paper back Gita and he promised himself he would attend the Swami's class. That day, as he stood with the Swami before the storefront, Howard had also noticed the sign, little sign in the window. Lectures in Bhagavad Gita, AC Bhaktivedanta Swami, Monday, Wednesday and Friday, 7 to 9 p.m. Will you bring your friends? Prabhupada had asked. Yes, Howard promised, Monday evening. The summer evening was warm, and in the storefront, the back windows and the front doors were opened wide. Young men, several of them dressed in black denims and the uh, button-down sport shirts with broad, dull stripes, had left their worn sneakers by the front door and were now sitting on the floor. Most of them were from the Lower East Side. No one had had to go to a great trouble to come here. The little room was barren. No pictures, no furniture, no rug, not even a chair. Only a few plain straw mats. A single bulb hung from the ceiling into the center of the room. It was seven o'clock and about a dozen people had gathered when the Swami suddenly opened the side door and entered the room. He wasn't wearing a shirt and the saffron cloth that wrapped his torso left his arms and some of his chest bare. His complexion was smooth, golden brown, and as they watched him, his head shaven, his ears uh, long lobed, and his aspect grave, he seemed like pictures they had seen of the Buddha in meditation. He was old, yet erect in his posture, fresh and radiant. His forehead was decorated with the yellowish clay marking of the Vaishnavas. Prabhupada recognized big, bearded Howard and smiled. You have brought your friends? Yes, Howard answered with his, in his loud, resonant voice. Ah, very good. Prabhupada stepped out of his white shoes, sat down on a thin mat, faced his congregation and indicated they could all be seated. He distributed several pairs of brass hand cymbals and 
briefly demonstrated the rhythm one two three he began playing a startling ringing sound he began singing hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 rama hare rama 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 hare hare it was the audience turn chant he told them some already knew gradually the others caught up caught on and after a few rounds all were chanting together most of these young men and the few young women present had at one time or another embarked on the psychological uh, psychological voyage in search of a new world of expanded consciousness boldly and recklessly they had entered the turbulent forbidden waters of lsd peyote and magic mushrooms heedless of warnings they had risked everything and done it yet they there was merit in their valor their eagerness to find the extra dimensions of the self to get beyond ordinary existence even if they didn't know what the beyond was or whether they would ever return to the comfort of ordinary nonetheless whatever truth they had found uh, they <clears throat> remained unfulfilled and whatever worlds they had reached their young psychological uh, uh, voyagers had always returned to the lower east side now they were sampling the hare krishna mantra when the kirtan suddenly sprang up from the swami's cymbals and sonorous voice they immediately felt that it was going to be something far out here was another chance to trip out and willingly they began to flow within with it they would surrender their minds and explore the limits of the chanting for all it was worth most of them had already associated the mantra with the mystical upanishad and gita which had called out to them in words of mystery eternal spiritual sorry eternal spirit uh, negating illusion but whatever it is this indian mantra let it come they thought let its waves carry us far and high let's take it and let the effects come whatever the price let it come the chanting seemed simple and natural and uh, enough it was sweet and wasn't going to harm anyone it was in its own way far out as propa chanted in his own inner ecstasy he observed his motley congregation he was breaking dr- ground in a new land now as the hand cymbals rang the hand the call and response of the hare krishna mantra swelled filling the evening some neighbors were annoyed a puerto rican ch- uh, <coughs> children enchanted appeared at the door and window uh, looking to light came exotic it was yet anyone could see that a swami was raising an ancient prayer in praise of god this wasn't rock or jazz he was a holy man a swami making a public religious demonstration but the combination was strange an old indian swami chanting an ancient mantra with a sh- with a store front full of young american hippies singing along propat sang on his shaven head held high and tilted his body trembling slightly with emotion confidently he led the mantra absorbed in pure devotion and they responded <clears throat> more passerbys were drawn to the front window and open door some jeered but the chanting was too strong without the sound of the kirtan even the car horn uh, sorry within the sound of the kirtan even the car horns were a faint uh, staccato the vibration of auto engines and the rumble of trucks continued but in the distance now unnoticed gathered under the dim electric light in the bare room the group chanted after their leader growing gradually from a feeble hesitant chorus to an approximate <coughs> harmony of voices they <coughs> they continued clapping and chanting putting into it whatever they could in the hopes of discovering its secrets this swami was not simply giving some 5 minute sample demonstration for the moment he was their leader their guide in an uncommon realm 
Howard and Keith's little encounter with the Kirtan in Calcutta had left them outsiders. The chanting had never before come like this, right in the middle of Lower, Eastern, Lower East Side with a genuine Swami leading them. In their minds were psychedelic ambitions to see the face of God, fantasies and visions of Hindu teachings, and the presumptions that IT or it was all impersonal light. Prabhupada had encountered a similar group of on the Bavari and he knew this group wasn't experiencing the mantra in the proper disciplined reverence and knowledge, but he let <clears throat> them chant in their own way. In time, their submission to the spiritual sound, their purification, their enlightenment and ecstasy in the chanting and hearing Hare Krishna would come. He stopped the kirtan. The chanting had swept back the world, but now the lower east side rushed in again. The children at the door began to chant, to chatter and laugh. Cars and trucks made their rumblings heard once more, and a voice shouted from a nearby apartment, demanding quiet. It was now past 7.30, half an hour uh, had elapsed. <clears throat> now today, we shall begin the fourth chapter, what Krishna, Lord Krishna says to Arjuna. His lecture is very basic and yet, for the restless youth, heavily philosophical. Some can't take it, and they raise rudely upon hearing the Swami's first words put on their shoes at the front door and return to the street. Others had left as soon as they saw the singing was over. Still, this is his best group yet. A few of Bavari congregation are present. The boys from the Moat Street are here, and they are specifically looking for a guru. Many in the group had already read Bhagavad Gita, and they are not too proud to hear <clears throat> and admit that they didn't understand it. It's an, uh, around, uh, sorry, it's another hot and noisy July evening outside his door. Children are on summer vacation and they stay out on the street until dark. Nearby, a big dog is barking, row, row, row. The traffic creates constant rumbling. Just outside the window, little girls are uh, shrieking and all this makes lecturing difficult. Yet, despite the distraction of children, traffic and dogs, he wants the door open. If it is closed, he says, why is it closed? People may come in. He continues undaunted, <coughs> quoting Sanskrit, holding his audi audience and developing his urgent message. While the relentless cacophony uh, rivals uh, his every word. Row, row, row. Ich, ja, shrieking like a, a little Spanish, which has the girls disturb the whole block. In the distance, a man shouts from his window, Get out here! Get out here! Prabhupada asks them not to make noise. Ro, on uh, one of the boys in the temple, the man is chasing the kids now. Prabhupada, yes, yes, these children are making a disturbance. Ask them, Rao, oh, sorry, Roy, yes, that's what, the man's chasing them right now. Prabhupada, they are making noises. Roy, he's chasing them now. The man chases the ch children away, but they'll be back. You can't chase the children off the street. They live there, and the big dog never stops barking. And who can stop the cars? The cars are always there. Prabhupada uses the cars to give an example. When a car momentarily comes into our vision on Second Avenue, we certainly don't think that it had no existence before. We saw it or that it ceases to exist once it has passed from view. Similarly, when Krishna goes from this planet to another, it doesn't mean he no longer exists, <clears throat> although it may appear that way. Actually, he has only left our sight. Krishna and his incarnations constantly appear and disappear on innumerable planets throughout the innumerable universes of the material creation. The cars are always passing, roaring and rumbling throughout through every word Prabhupada speaks, the door is open and he is poised at the edge of a river of carbon monoxide, uh, asphalt, rumbling tires and uh, constant waves of traffic. He has come a long way from 
the banks of his Yamuna in Vrindavan, where great saints and sages had gathered through the ages to discuss Krishna consciousness. But his audience lives here amid this scene. So he has come here. Besides Second Avenue's rushing river of traffic uh, to speak loudly the ageless message, <clears throat> he is still stressing the same point. Whatever you do in Krishna consciousness, however little it may be, is eternally good for you. Yet now, more than uptown or in on the Bavari, he is calling his hearers to take to Krishna consciousness fully and become devotees. He assures them, anyone can become a devotee and friend of Krishna like Arjuna. You will be surprised that Lord Chaitanya's principal, principal disciple, sorry, disciples were all so-called fallen in society. He appointed Haridas Thakur to the highest position in his spiritual mission, although he happened to take birth in Muhammadian family. So there is no bar for anyone. Everyone can become spiritual master, provided he knows the science of Krishna. This is the science of Krishna, this Bhagavad Gita. And if anyone knows it uh, perfectly, then he becomes a spiritual master. And this transcendental vibration, Hare Krishna, will help us by cleaning the dust from the mirror of our mind. On the mind, we have accumulated material dust like just like on the second avenue due to the constant traffic of motor cars, there's always a creation of dust over everything. Similarly, by our manipulation, manipul manipulation of materialistic activities, there are some material dusts which are accumulated on the mind and therefore we are unable to see things in true perspective. So this process, the vibration of the transcendental sound, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare, will cleanse the dust. And as soon as the dust is cleared, then as you see your nice face in the mirror, similarly you can see your real constitutional position as spirit soul. In, the, in Sanskrit language it is said, Bhava Maha Dhavagni. Lord Chaitanya said that, Lord Chaitanya's picture you have seen in the front window, he is dancing and chanting Hare Krishna. So it doesn't matter what a person was doing before, what sinful activities. A person may not be perfect at first, but if he is engaged in service, then he will be purified. Suddenly a Bavari derelict enters, whistling and drunkenly shouting. The audience remains seated, not knowing what to make of it. Drunk. How are, how are yeah, I'll be right back. I brought another thing. Prabhupada, don't disturb. Sit down. We are talking, talking seriously. Drunkard. I'll put it up there in a church. All right. I'll be right back. The man is white-haired with short, grisly gr beard and frowsy clothing. His order reeks through the temple. But then he suddenly careens out the door and is gone. Prabhupada chuckles softly and returns immediately to his lecture. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter what a person was doing before. If he engages in Krishna consciousness, chanting Hare Krishna and Bhagavad Gita, it should be concluded that he is a saint. He is a saintly person. Abhichet uh, Sudara Charo. Never mind if he may have some external immoral habit due to his past association. It doesn't matter. Some way or the other. One should become Krishna conscious and then gradually he will become a saintly person as he goes on executing this process of Krishna consciousness. There is a story about how habit is a second nature. There was a thief and he went on pilgrimage with some friends. So at night when the others were sleeping because his habit was to steal at night, he got up and was taking someone's baggage. But then he was thinking, oh, I have come to this holy place of pilgrimage, but still I am committing the thief, uh, theft by habit. No, I shall not do it. So then he took someone's bag and put it in another place. And for the whole night, the poor fellow moved the bags of pilgrims from here to there. But due to his conscience, uh, because he was on a holy pilgrim, he did not actually take anything. So in the morning when everyone got up, they looked around and said, where is my bag? I didn't, don't see it. And another man says, I don't see my bag. And then someone else says, oh, there is your bag. So there was some row. So they thought, what is the matter? How has it so happened? Then the thief rose up 
and told all of his all of the friends my dear gentlemen i am a thief by occupation and because i have that habit to steal at night i couldn't stop myself but i thought i have come to this holy place so i won't do it therefore i placed one person's bag in another man's place please excuse me so this is habit he doesn't want to but he has a habit of doing it he has decided not to commit theft anymore but sometimes he does habitually so krishna says that in such conditions when one who has decided to stop all immoral habits and just take to this process of krishna consciousness if by chance he does something which is immoral in face of society that should not be taken account of in the next verse krishna says kshipram uh, bhavati dharmaatma because he has dovetailed himself in krishna consciousness it is sure that he will be saintly very soon suddenly the old derelict returns announcing his entrance how are ya yeah, he is carrying something he maneuvers his way through the group straight to the back of the temple where swami is sitting he opens the toilet room door puts two rolls of bathroom tissue inside closes the door and then turns to the sink sits some paper uh, towels on top of it and puts two or two more rolls of bathroom tissue and some more paper towels under the sink he then stands and turns around toward the swami and the audience the swami is looking at him and asks what is this the bum is silent now he has done the, his work propad begins to laugh thanking his visitor who is now moving toward the door thank you thank you very much the bum exits just see propad now addresses his congregation it is a natural tendency to give some service just see he is not in order but he thought that here is something let me give some service just see how automatically it comes this is natural the young men in the audience look at one another this is really far out first the chanting with the brass cymbals the swami looking like buddha and talking about krishna and chanting now chanting and now this crazy stuff with the bum but the swami stays cool he's really cool just sitting on the floor like he he is not afraid of anything just talking his philosophy about the soul and us becoming saints and even the old drunk becoming a saint after almost an hour the dog still barks and the kids still uh, squeal prabhupad is asking his hearers who are only beginning beginners in spiritual life to become totally dedicated preachers of krishna consciousness in the bhagavad gita you will find that anyone who preaches the gospel of bhagavad gita to the people of the world is the most dear the dearest person to krishna therefore it is our duty to preach principles of this bhagavad gita to make people krishna conscious prabhupad can't wait to tell them even if they aren't ready it's too urgent the world needs krishna conscious preachers people are suffering for want of krishna consciousness therefore each and every one of us should be engaged in the preaching work of krishna consciousness for the benefit of the whole world lord chaitanya whose picture is in the front of our store has very nicely preached the philosophy of krishna consciousness the lord says just take my orders all of you and become a spiritual master lord chaitanya gives the order that in every country you go and preach krishna consciousness so if we take up this missionary work to preach krishna to preach bhagavad gita as it is without interpretation and without any material motives behind it as it is then krishna says it shall be done we shouldn't have any attraction for worldly activities otherwise we can't have krishna but it doesn't mean that we should uh, be inimical to the people of the world no it is our duty to give them the highest instruction that you become krishna conscious and a young man in the audience seems unable to contain himself and begins making his own incoherent speech prabhupad no you cannot disturb just like, just now man standing up now wait a minute man a quarrel begins as others try to quiet him prabhupad no 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 not just now no no you cannot ask just now man well i am trying to talk prabhupad 
No, just now you cannot ask. But wait a minute, man, wait. Prabhupada, why do you interfere just now? We have a regular uh, question, uh, question time. Others in the audience, let the man finish. Yeah, let him talk. The man's supporters defend his right to speak while others try to silence him. Second man, I have just one question, please. How long is an individual allowed to expect it to give, go on without any type of thought? How long? Prabhupada, I am not finished. We'll give question time after finishing the talk. The parties go on quarreling. All right. I am very glad you are curious, but please wait. Have some patience because we have not finished. As soon as we finish, after five minutes, then 10 minutes, I will tend to your question. Don't be impatient. Sit down. The audience quiets down and the Swami goes with his talk. After five minutes, Prabhupada. All right, this gentleman is impatient. We shall stop here. Now, what is your question, sir? Man, practically we tend to place emphasis on those we identify with the fact itself. Many people are meant to explain the why force, uh, why for, and where force of metaphysical truth that I think, therefore I am. Prabhupada, what is your particular question? Man, I have no answer to that question. Rather, but that I attempt, I live, I breathe. Yes, man. So ability, tell me why I have nothing to do with it. May I understand the why force and where's Prabhupada. That's all right. Man, I have difficulty in you. I have difficulty in saying Prabhupada. So long as we are in this material world, there are so many problems. Man, not many problems. It is not many problems. This is the greatest fact I have. I know. Prabhupada, yes. Man, I also know that the vice and where force of my particular. Prabhupada, yes. Man, I didn't come here, but let me explain my position. This isn't necessarily. I feel I must. I think the difference is to learn. You will find it innumerable times by the same token. Maybe we are able to reconcile the fact of individual being for a long time to find out why. Prabhupada turning to one of the boys. Roy, can you answer his question? It is a general question. You can answer yes. Roy turns sympathetically to the rumbling questioner and Prabhupada addresses his audience. Enough questions. His voice now seems tired and resigned. Let us have Kirtan. And the lower east side once again abates. The chanting begins. The bra brass uh, chimbals, Prabhupada's voice carrying the melody and the audience res responding. It goes for half an hour and then stops. It was. It is now nine. The audience sit before Swamiji while a boy brings him an apple, a small wooden bowl and a knife. As most of the audience still sits and watches, gauzing the after effects of the chanting as though it had been some new drug. The Swami cuts the apple in half, then in fourths, then in eights, until there are many pieces. He takes one himself and asks one of the boys to pass the ball around. Swamiji holds back his head, deftly pops a slice of apple into his mouth without touching his fingers to his lips. He chews a bit, uh, ruminating his lips closed. The members of the congregation munch silently on a little piece of apple. Prabhupada stands, slips into his shoes and exits through the side door. As Prabhupada retired to his apartment, his guest disappeared through the front door back into the city. Don Ruffle and uh, would turn out the lights, lock the front door and go to sleep on the floor in their blankets. Don and Raphael had needed a place to stay when they heard about the Swami's place. Prabhupada had a policy that any boy who expressed even a little interest in becoming his student could stay in the storefront and make it his home. Of course, Prabhupada would ask them to contribute toward the rent and meals, but if Don and uh, Raphael, they had no money, then it was still all right provided they helped in other ways. 
Don and Rafael were the first two boys to take advantage of Prabhupada's offer. They were attracted to Swamiji and the chanting, but they weren't serious about his philosophy or the dis disciplines of devotional life. They had no job, no money, their hair was long and unkempt, and they lived and slept in the same uh, clothes day after day. Prabhupada stipulated that at least while they were on premises, they could not break his rules. No intoxication, illicit sex, meat eating or gambling. He knew these two boarders weren't serious students, but he allowed them to stay in hopes that gradually they would become serious. Often, some uh, wayfarer, wayfaring stranger would stop by looking for a place to stay the night and Don and Raphael would welcome him. An old white-bearded Indian turned Christian who was on a walking mission proclaiming the end of the world and whose feet were covered with bandages once slept for a few nights on a wooden bench uh, in the storefront. Some nights as many as ten drifters would seek shelter at the storefront and Don and Raphael would attempt them, admit them, uh, explaining that the Swami didn't object as long as they got up early. Even drifters whose only interest was a free meal could stay, and after the morning class and breakfast, they would usually drift off again into Maya. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you for this narration. Very yeah. nice. I will take should... one more hour again. So I thought, okay. <laughs> yeah, yes, Prabhu. Yes. So though we are not in the US, we get, got a glimpse of what is uh, in the US in those days. And then, uh, yeah, so many points, the importance of preaching and techniques and uh, tips of how to preach. So all these things were yeah, what we could read. And yeah, we can grab that spirit of preaching is the essence. Yes, Prabhuji. Actually facing the uh, unknown crowd for the first time and uh, and seeing the conviction of Prabhupada is, is always an inspiration for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it shows like we usually our... our um, approach or our our inclination is we talk to only people whom who are familiar or at least some similarities in some way or the other if they are familiar no, then we try to approach and talk here Prabhupada is a Indian talking to a people of a different country different culture and never know them whether they will come or not come again yeah yes Prabhuji and that too you know in Indians in foreign where there is a lot of uh, laws right here yeah, when children scream you should not stop them when dogs bark you yeah they have more right than yeah so yeah bearing all those difficulties and uh, mainly the point mentioned here was um, yeah kirtan kirtan and katha these are the two powerful things that we should we should also actively the more more we do at least we are absorbed inside that hmm? and um, yeah if by the grace of uh, Prabhupada and Krishna if someone hears to that they also will take it yeah so these are the startup companies huh? how, how how did the company start it's like this yes Prabhuji yeah Yeah. Good. Then thank you very much for joining. We'll hear more next week. And um, Saturday and Sunday, I think some have some courses to take. And we will also be in London. So we will skip Saturday and Sunday classes. Anyway, I'll post it in the group. But uh, yeah, just want to share. Okay. 
वंचकल्पतृभ्य कृपा सिंधु पति पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम शिलपूपाद की जय सूर्य सत्स्वरूप गोस्वामी महाराज की जय हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण